Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Lawyers, Bankers, and Startup Entrepreneurs Talk Fintech. My name is Jill Fraser, and I will be your moderator for today. I just wanted to let everyone know we have about 460 registrants listening today from all over the world, including Canada and the US, the UK, Barbados, Greece, Trinidad, and Tobago. So welcome. Before we dive into the presentation, I would like to introduce our panel of speakers. Jay Gerprasad is the director of BMO Partners and is responsible for developing partnerships with industry, financial technologies, academia, and government institutions to support the acceleration of BMO's business strategies and build BMO's brand as an innovation thought leader. Jay draws upon his 13 years of experience in North American payments to accelerate business strategies in mobile, loyalty, and customer life cycle, life cycle management. Some of his recent achievements include leading the launch of Apple Pay, Android Pay, credit card alerts, real-time rewards balances, and the DMZ BMO FinTech Accelerator Program. Art Harrison is the co-founder and vice president of business development at Form Hero Inc. As a former software developer, entrepreneur, and marketing executive, Art brings a unique blend of technical and strategic skills to Form Hero. He is responsible for Form Hero's go-to market strategy, partnerships, and oversees all sales and marketing activities. Outside of Form Hero, Art often consults with organizations looking to use technology to impact customer experience and conversion rates. Don Johnson is a partner at Aird and Burles and is the co-chair of the Technology Law Group as well as the Privacy and Data Security Group. Don has diverse experience in technology of all kinds, intellectual property, mergers and acquisitions, procurement, privacy and data protection, and health law, and new technologies such as blockchain and autonomous vehicles. He regularly provides strategic advice to clients on licensing transactions, financing and development projects, negotiating and settling agreements and distribution arrangements. Wow, do I really do all that stuff? I do. You, you know what, Don? I think you do. Wow. <laughs> Tony Sabetta is a partner at Erdem Bernie LP, patent and trademark agents, which is a sister firm to Erdem Burles LLP, and is a registered patent agent in Canada and the U.S. When working with clients, Tony's primary focus is on developing and implementing intellectual property strategies with an eye towards nurturing the client's growth and long-term success including increasing their valuation. He is an active member of the firm's startup team, which works with early stage companies to educate and advise them on intellectual property matters and supports the Canadian startup community through free educational resources, seminars, speaking engagements, and sponsorships. And finally, I am a member of the, uh, a partner and member of the Financial Services Group at Aaron and Burles, with a practice focusing on corporate and commercial lending transactions, including syndicated credit facilities, secured loans, project financings, acquisition financings, venture capital investments, and asset-based lending. Okay, just a little summary of what you're going to hear today. Don is going to start us off talking about the fintech industry, disruptor or enabler. Jay and Art are then going to talk about whether banks and fintech startups can work together to capitalize on the fintech client service model. We're going to then hear from Don again, who will talk about what, some, what are some setbacks that might stall the growth of the fintech industry in Canada. Jay and Art will then discuss best practices for organizations interested in, or, in engaging with startups, as well as tips for startups looking to sell to major organizations. Tony will talk about how to overcome challenges in patenting your, finan in your fintech inventions, with Don finishing up with legal solutions for startups when working with the big banks. We will try and save time for questions at the end of the presentation. On your webinar con console, you will see a small window for questions. All right, I am now going to turn it over to Don. Well, the first topic is whether the fintech industry is disruptor or enabler. <clears throat> and you know, it's, a, it, it, it's tempting to, to, uh, uh, to sort of whitewash this and, and, and say that the fintech industry is somehow homogenous. It's not. It's not at all. There are, there are as many different kinds of fintechs as there are uh, companies out there doing stuff. So the answer is it's both disruptive and enabling. Um, but you can put them kind of roughly into a couple of groups. Uh, and uh, uh, Jay's going to talk a little bit later about, about uh, uh, the, the first of these that I mentioned. That's the, th those that partner with uh, the financial institutions. And, and some of those are, are, 
our suppliers. You know, that's the right word to use. Uh, but but uh, others have a special relationship that uh, that uh, both Jay and Art will will chat about a little bit later. Um, but they 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 work with the the FIs that uh, uh, they're they're not uh, competing with the FIs necessarily. Uh, and and of course those that uh, that are partners or suppliers are they're, again they're not in distinct categories. Um, the other group are those that uh, that essentially do uh, uh, compete with uh, uh, with uh, financial institutions, and uh, um, you know they the banks will, as I'll explain in a minute, will will tolerate uh, uh, some of them, uh, and even secretly uh, uh, encourage <laughs> some of them. They, they they like what they're doing, so. The fintechs that do partner with FIs provide some interesting, uh, uh, I guess, functionality that, that FIs need. Uh, they, they, can, they can often accomplish certain business processes on a faster timetable than, uh, than the traditional FIs have been able to do. Uh, they are, they're willing to assume risks that financial institutions are unwilling to take, and in fact, should not take. You know, we we like our ba our banks to take it easy, and uh, uh, but the the FIs will will often take some risks that uh, the banks won't take. They use their own money to invent stuff, uh, and and if it, the the model in, in effect works out a little bit like what big pharma uh, has done with biotechs. Biotechs will take risks. They'll, they, they put a bunch of experts in that, that are completely focused on one uh, drug, or of course in this case it's a uh, financial technology, uh, and, and they'll, 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 uh, uh, they'll either succeed or fail on that basis. Those that do succeed, as Jay's going to explain in a, in a minute or two, uh, will really, in essence, have uh, uh, provided banks an opportunity to to cherry pick the very best of the of, of the uh, uh, what the fintech industry has to offer. So, from a bank's point of view, you might say a fintech is a or the fintechs generally are a group of companies that are willing to do development off balance sheet, as far as the banks are concerned, um, take risks, and then present to the banks. Uh, completed uh, products and services that are really good, or potentially really good. Uh, there are some risks, and which I know Jay's going to talk about those later. Next slide. Um, so uh, the, those fintechs that compete with financial institutions do have an additional risk, and that is the risk of, that the big financials won't like that very much. Uh, you know, if it, people can eat your lunch with permission, but not not necessarily steal it. So that that's really uh, uh, a, a risk. But the fintechs that do operate under the tent of the big FIs uh, may, in fact, in in a sense, compete with them. Um, the FIs will allow them to operate because really, sometimes the businesses that they carry on are not businesses that the big the big banks want to be in. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know this for a fact, but imagine that that banks don't want to get involved in micropayments between Canada and other countries like Philippines or or uh, India or places like that, where people will often repatriate or you know send money back to support families. That's expensive, um, but FIs uh, 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 will do it. Um, perhaps though the uh, uh, smaller fintech players would be able to do it more efficiently, cheaper, assuming risk and so forth, handling all the, the know your client and, and, and whatnot that is necessary, and provide a good service that really, in effect, doesn't cost the big banks anything and may even save them money. So, Jay. Yeah, so um, thanks, Don. Um, so really um, what you're looking at here on this slide is hopefully a lot of you have seen something like this model before um, that really illustrates how banks and fintechs uh, can play together, can work together. 
Short answer to the question, can banks and fintechs work together? Yes. The, the, the long gray answer is they have to. Um, when you look at any relationship, business relationship that's out there, and even when you think back to your, your school days, Business 101, like you have to form collaborative relationships to be successful. And the fintech space, the banking space is no different. It, it's just now down to the nuance of what type of relationship do you want to form? So what, what we try to do is we try to understand what are the strengths of the fintechs at the table and then what are our own strengths. In, in, in looking internally, we know that our strength at BMO and I'm sure the strength that the other FIs um, and Canada as well as globally is um, we have that big customer trust and we have this great brand available to us and we have some great customer relationships. We own the customer relationship. We, relationships we know who our customers are and we're also able to bring scale and distribution where a smaller fintech who's a new entrant into the market wouldn't necessarily be able to do on day one um, the the other big thing that we have um, that I know a lot of fintechs out there in the marketplace um, struggle with not because they don't know or um, because they don't want to know is the regulatory and compliance um, aspect um, uh, around the, the financial services sector. Banks are great um, at that. Bank, yeah. Banks are great at that. We've yeah, been yeah, doing it. BMO <laughs> has been doing it for um, two, over 200 years now. Other banks have been doing it for hundreds and 150 years now. But fintechs, you guys are the new kids on the block. Not that you shouldn't be looking at regulatory and compliance um, issues that are coming down into the marketplace and that are legacy to our marketplace, but you should really be focusing on what you know best, your technology, your customer experience. And by partnering with banks, that's where you get access to our legacy information um, that, that we can help you build your business, that aspect of your business. So do what you do best and let us focus on what we do best. Um, and for us, what fintechs bring to the table is they bring this great nimbleness um, and agility that some of the major um, FIs, and I'm speaking about Canada, US, global, don't necessarily have because we have all these older legacy systems that we're still trying to navigate through. The other thing that these fintechs bring to the table is they bring this really great creative thinking, um, a really great digital mindset um, and they really understand who their customer is going to be um, or potentially who their customer is today. Um, so they're bringing this new way of thought, this fresh way of thought um, that we want to partner with them uh, to help us understand how we can enhance our customer experience or maybe we look at it in other areas of the continuum. If you look at the internal capability side, just because we're building internally doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a role for FinTech at the table. Some of um, the, the great things that come from internal builds actually come from uh, FinTechs that weren't necessarily that successful where they had to end up uh, folding their business and getting absorbed into financial institutions. That's not a bad thing because that great talent and know-how is still in the ecosystem that can help build it um, just in a different aspect. You, you think of something like um, RBC's Nomi app um, or, or Nomi functionality where they're looking at tracking customer spend in an intelligent way. Um, it was an internal build, but I'm sure a lot of the players who helped build that were from FinTech players um, uh, in the past. Um, and then as you move along the continuum, you start seeing things like sourcing, um, where that's your traditional, that's how the way that the world has always worked in the past. But what I'm starting to see now in the marketplace is there's this mind shift happening. Um, from those traditional players like like Microsoft who have done a great job in telling people hey we have great software um, but a lot of people don't know all the other things that Microsoft does a lot of the other more nimble more fintechy type of things that Microsoft does so Microsoft is starting to set up programs to work with financial institutions um, so they can start to move along the continuum where they're more partners now and, and potentially they're they're working on white label solutions with um, uh, with financial institutions. So th there is a shift happening in the marketplace. Um, and then when you start to look at the all the way at the other end of the spectrum, um, that, that, that awesome investment acquisition um, gold mine that's available um, where 
it, it can happen. Um, some of them are very far and few between, but some of them, you, you just saw in the news the other day, TD acquired uh, Layer 6. Um, uh, to help them develop their in, um, artificial, in, uh, uh, help them develop um, understanding of who their customer is through artificial intelligence. You think of something like that, and you think, "Wow, that must have really, really been difficult for TD to get to a place like that where they're investing in a company." But but then you have to look at some of the back history behind it, where Layer Six actually came from Creative Destruction Labs. Creative Destruction Labs beats down, beats down the, the fintechs that are there to help them grow, help them understand, help their business. So it's not like TD put up their hand and say, hey, we want to buy Layer 6 tomorrow. TD actually probably worked with Creative Destruction Labs um, to help assess who Layer 6 is before they made that decision. So the, the point is, is there's a lot happening within the space. There's a lot happen happening within the, the continuum. and. For banks, for fintechs, you can't hang your hat just on one thing. Um, banks have to play within the entire spectrum. My advice for fintechs, though, is to really understand your business and play with one or two um, um, uh, components within the spectrum because then you start to spread yourself too thin um, and you're trying to be a sourcing partner. You're trying to be a real partner. You're trying to be a white label and you can't do all of it because you don't have um, all of the resources available to you. Yeah, and, and one of the things, you know, we're, as a startup company that's, you know, kind of engaged in the broader, uh, at least the Toronto community of fintechs, um, particularly for the early stage ones, um, a lot of times they, they have great ideas, they have incredible talent, but they're not even sure where on that continuum their idea fits, because they, they understand it, they know that there is a, a problem that they're able to solve, but they, they sometimes go in and they think they're going to be the disruptor. They're, they're going to go in and they're going to change that, um, and then they go in and they start looking at the customer acquisition costs, the, you know, the, the, that, the fact that the banks actually have all of these clients and this reputation, and they, they're trying to understand, well, how could I apply this? Is this something that they would help me promote? Is this something that I could white label? Is the core technology something that could actually, you know, I thought it was going to be on money lending, but it's really the HR talent mm -hmm. side is going to be applicable here. Um, so it's always, you know, engaging early. And I know BMO has done a great job through, like, the accelerators, through partnerships, through engaging the community. It's, it's sometimes just getting in with those startups, recognizing that there's some, you know, depending on their stage, there's some you just want to build a relationship with today and help them help them see paths forward and help them understand what where they could play, mm -hmm. that this could be a white label solution, this could be something else. And, and it, to do that, here's what you would need to, to continue focusing on, and maybe some of these other areas aren't important. But we see that a lot. We, a couple of companies we know recently thought they were going to disrupt and uh, worked with a couple of the big FIs, and they saw an opportunity with their own advisors and their other groups. So it, it's, it's an important one that, that a lot of people, particularly if you have a 20-year-old startup founder that mm -hmm. never, you know, didn't, hasn't worked in the corporate space at any time, they, they just don't understand. You know, yeah. They just see, like, this is a problem. I'm going to make it, and people use it. Um, and, and, and that's really my advice to the financial institutions that are listening uh, today is that never take a, uh, a fintech at face value when they come in to talk to you on day mm -hmm. one. Uh, you know your business best. They understand what their capabilities are, but then in the first couple of discovery conversations, you need to find that right intersection, that right balance between uh, the both of you because the opportunity that they're coming in on day one might not be the opportunity uh, that that you see five years or sorry five months down down the road and never allow a fintech to tell you we're <laughs> here to disrupt your business uh, we're here to change the the way everything is done that's not really how it happens um, there are there's a lot of finessing a lot of relationship building a lot of fine-tuning but it's never a one-stop yeah. like we're going to wipe out all of your, your fraud processes today and we're going to build it new and it's going to be awesome. Like, that's all smoke and mirrors, <laughs> to be honest. You know, I, the, I have the impression that if, if, a, if a fintech uh, headed up by the, the, the 20 year old you're talking about plays its cards right, uh, a bank can really become a benevolent uncle. Absolutely. Uh, and, yeah. That's and you know, it, 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 and benevolent uncles don't, don't just give out money. Yeah. You know, they, but they, you get good advice. You get a, a pat on the back when you're Absolutely. down. You you might get some money. You might get introduction to other kinds of resources and and uh, uh, talent that it's, it's is not available. Yeah. It, it really is, and, and we we've had a few of those uncles ourselves. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and they they've been great, and and they they get the benefit of being early of of having 
you know, really helping set direction and and being, you know, a lot of times what some fintech, especially when they're partnering, it, it you know, it's a bit of a commod commodity. Ultimately, they want to service all the banks. Usually, they don't want to service yeah. one. Yeah. But to be an early player, you have your direction. You you have the the marketing play of of being first there, and knowing that maybe in three years everyone will have it. But you've got your yeah. your major wins out of out of being the first to, to the table. So. I have a question actually, and that is that, uh, and a lot of people might might uh, be interested in the answer to this. Uh, do, it, it, when there is a relationship that starts between a, a fintech and a bank, do the banks like to keep that secret, or do they do they are, are they public about it? And if they do like to keep it secret, how do they accomplish that? Yeah. And what do they do if there's a problem? So um, I could speak from um, past experiences <laughs> with uh, Form Hero. Um, uh, BMO does absorb uh, Form Hero's capability and a couple of our uh, experience customer experiences, um, where um, we actually met um, Art and, and Ryan, his mm -hmm. other co-founder at the DMZ, where uh, we have a BMO DMZ FinTech Accelerator program, where we worked with them for a few months doing proof of concepts um, with the initial thinking that you're ours, like we <laughs> we wanna we wanna mine you and make sure that we have a great customer experience from Form Hero coming out of DMZ, but what we we found is that in with working with the guys we 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 really liked them and we really wanted them to succeed as a business and it started to become this this mutually beneficial relationship where we said you know what you have a really great experience um, we can move so much of the dial uh, to, to, to get you integrated in BMO, but we'd also like to make sure that you have enough legs uh, to, for success. So if you want to work with another FI, go right ahead. And then what happened is uh, we actually gave a recommendation mm -hmm. uh, to another FI to help them grow their business. So uh, we at BMO are very open and very transparent in, in the partnerships uh, that we do to a degree, obviously. Um, but when, when we do see opportunities where we can help um, one of our partners grow, uh, we take that opportunity because um, there is no relationship if if it's a one-sided relationship. Yeah, so that's the being BMO thing. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I would say that, that wasn't, uh, like, as, we have a great relationship. It was still, as a startup, a terrifying ask of, <laughs> you know, there, there's another FI, you think you could, uh, you know, they, they'd like to talk. Yeah, uh, that's right. What um, are you doing to us? Yeah, but, but, but to, to Jay's point, our, our kind of, our pitch when we talk to any FI or any of the big organizations is, there, there's a, a network effect. And so mm -hmm. we go in, we learn about experiences, we learn about products, we learn about the fraud process, we learn about mm -hmm. what your customers are doing, and we build that into our platform. And so everyone just benefits with new releases, mm -hmm. with new opportunities. So if, if you could embrace that mentality uh, and not just think about, I want to lock this one thing down, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of yeah. the idea of technology in general. If you can embrace that, there's usually a lot more to gain mm -hmm. than just saying, we've got it now, let's lock it down, and we won't touch it for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we should say a, a, a few things about uh, you know what happens uh, uh, with fintechs. They it, it it takes money to to uh, to develop an, any product, and um, uh, it, Art will probably be able to confirm that whatever amount you think it's going to take, uh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah. just uh, you know double it or, or triple it, triple it. Yeah. Maybe, at least, maybe uh, add a zero <laughs> yep. at the end. Uh, most of the time these days, fintechs get get uh, their capital from from private equity and and some uh, venture capital uh, as well. Um, venture capital um, is not a natural fit necessarily for for every uh, fintech uh, because in fact some fintechs may even be inimical to uh, to uh, uh, VCs, but. Uh, uh, you know, private equity is is where most of the money comes from, and and you know the the thing about it is that if if private equity stops kind of liking uh, fintechs as an asset class because that's how they think of it, it's an asset class, uh, uh, then they'll go to something else. You know, right now if you use the word cannabis in a, in an elevator downtown here, <laughs> somebody will throw money at you, <laughs> it's a, and 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 Tony will explain later that. You know, if you use the word blockchain, yeah. they'll throw even more money at you. And, and, and if you use blockchain and cannabis together, <laughs> it, I don't know how you do that, but, but it, it, they'll, they'll throw so much money you won't know what to do. Um, 
uh, tax changes can can cause a problem. You know, we're we're now looking at uh, renegotiating NAFTA. Uh, we've just put CETA together uh, um, between here and Europe. All of this actually uh, both increases and 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 decreases depending on on uh, uh, the industry, the availability of uh, of uh, capital for uh, for development. Uh, so, it it's a it, it's tough out there. It's a tough thing, and and that's that's why uh, uh, when you're in a uh, when you're running a fintech, uh, you you have to be prepared in the morning to get kicked in the chest, and then say, oh, that was that was great. Let's <laughs> let's do that again. Yeah. So, it's uh, it's kind of tough. You know, and I'll I'll add to that. Even on the 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 FI side. Um, in being in this space where we're working with fintechs, uh, you have to be prepared in the morning to get kicked <laughs> in the chest as well. <laughs> uh, I tell everyone that I have about 100 conversations, and uh, probably out of those 100 conversations with fintechs, one of them becomes a follow-up conversation. Wow. So it's a, it's a slow, long churn, uh, just, just keeping dialogue open with folks, and, and that's just the nature of the business. So. Um, um, wh which really leads to um, the, the next part where uh, what are some of the best practices uh, for organizations that are interested in engaging with startups. So um, a few years ago when I started this journey in this space, within the fintech space, um, it was brand new. Um, there wasn't a lot of material out there. There weren't a lot of best practices out there. And now you see um, uh, Ivy League schools popping up um, courses all over the place. So by no means take this as a I'm an Ivy League professor. However, <laughs> from, my, from my experience, I, I can come to the table with a few different best practices um, that, that I've had over the past and a couple of them are um, the management experience. Um, when you think about the management experience within with a fintech that you're working with, never gloss over um, how much diligencing can be done. Um, you're diligencing from day one all the way to uh, post-implementation um, uh, two years from now. Um, and, and the reason why is that because the space is so new, because the players are so fresh, you never know what the risk can be. You think about, um, uh, I have a little graphic, a little cartoon about uh, Uber there. Um, you think about all the troubles that they're going through. You, you think about um, uh, Sulfi and, and all the troubles that they're going through with their management. Um, was that something that was diligenced up at front? Probably not. Is that something that financial institutions or other major organizations should be looking at today in forming partnerships with uh, these new entrants into the marketplace? Absolutely. That's just the nature of the world now. You're um, judged by your friends. Exactly. <laughs> the, and the, the great thing, and I touched upon um, accelerator programs a little bit earlier, the great thing about accelerator programs like uh, the DMZ, um, like uh, Creative Destruction Labs, is that it allows the, the fintechs to get beaten up. It allows them to go through the rigor time and time again, um, week after week, month after month, to a place where um, the FIs don't necessarily have to do, or major organizations don't necessarily have to do all the major lifting and diligencing. You have your uh, accelerator incubator um, uh, program helping you do that. Um, so so I, I can stress very, very um, uh, hardly that um, if you have an opportunity to work with an accelerator or an incubator uh, to help you find these, um, uh, the, these fintech partnerships do so because they're a great place uh, um, uh, to find and meet great startups like Form Hero. <laughs> um, uh, the, the other point that I could provide you is that um, don't, don't, don't hesitate on um, uh, being a fast follower. Um, sometimes the best approach is not always rushing to get to market fast. While, yes, fintechs do have that nimbleness of speed and they do want to get to market because that's how their bread and butter um, uh, is won and they're going to start growing their business. 
be cautious from a major organization perspective. Let the technology normalize. Um, let the, the financials stabilize. Uh, one of the biggest um, uh, concerns that can arise from fintech partnerships is that um, you, you're basically throwing a dart at a board trying to figure out what your financials are uh, because sometimes it's never been done before. Um, so don't be afraid to do proof of concepts. Don't be afraid to let the proof of concepts last for a month or two, and don't be afraid to do another proof of concept after that um, to really understand what you're getting into. Um, but also, don't be afraid to throw some uh, small dollars to your partner <laughs> because they can't do all of this stuff for free. You want to keep them around, and you want to make sure they succeed as well. Yeah. Um and, and a lot of the you know same advice comes from uh, from the startups perspective so just for a little you know kind of story um, we're sometimes being a fintech startup is a little bit like being an overnight success band uh, yeah we're, we're nimble yeah we're you know look at this amazing thing that happened but it's it's the two three four years that happened before that that no one really sees and and we've been through that you know we one of the things that we've seen, we, we're working with a couple of the FIs here in Toronto. Uh, we're at some stage with basically all the other five or six, depending on how you classify it. And where we've seen the most success is when there's they have a process. You know, they 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 kind of have a point of contact. You know, that's the BMO model. It's been the model at a couple places where someone is helping you as a startup navigate the internal politics because you know you have to understand that the buying, um, you know, the way that that purchasing is made is not one team or one line of business, you know, there's AML that's going to get involved, there's fraud teams, there's um, major, major technology and cloud governance stakeholders that, that are all part of this. And as a startup, which maybe at the time of uh, introduction is, you know, three, four or five people, to manage uh, that independently where you're getting the same question from four different groups of 40 people just worded differently enough that you have to redocument everything you do and go through an entirely new audit. It, it, it kind of kills the process and you end up spending so much time on process um, instead of on innovation and on product. And so having someone internally, if, you, if you're committed to innovation, if you're co committed to looking for new technologies, having people that are there um, basically running project for you, that are, that are shielding you from things that are saying, hey, listen, everyone, get your questions together and bring it to the team. Let's, let's do this in a way that doesn't, that doesn't destroy them because ultimately the, the, the bank, the organization wants to benefit from this. But you can kind of talk yourself out of it. You can get in your own way by just saying, well, you know, we, we're going to judge them. It, we'll know how good they are by how well they can navigate our own system. Well, that's, that's kind of flawed. It, it leads to you getting the best administrators, not the best technology. You get the people that know how to just play the game, that, that know how to document things. And there's value to that, but it's not the, the only way to go. Um, and I, I would add to that yeah. is that that person that the financial institution or the, the, the group that the financial institutions gets to be that, that centralized um, uh, point place for fintechs, um, they, 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 have to, they have to feel the, the emotion yeah, behind yeah. Uh, the, the fintech's relationships and the, their, the fintech's ability to enhance the customer experience. Um, if there's no conviction yeah. there, then it becomes this like automated like Absolutely. okay we'll introduce you to this line of business we'll introduce you to this line of business and nothing really becomes of it there really needs to be conviction in it the does. relationship Absolutely. or nothing will happen well it's not a relationship it's yes. not it's just yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know kind of kind of piggybacking on that is you know the once you've done that like the the one of the challenges when you're talking about organizations sometimes with 70 you know thousand people mm -hmm. is you've got a small core group of people that really have bought in they they feel the emotion they understand that but you know the leadership gets that they understand how critical this is to to the banks you know future growth to them you know staying competitive um, to them fending off the disruptors but then the processes that are downstream aren't necessary you know it takes a long time for those to adapt so we can speak from from our own experience you know we we got a agreement with with one of the with one organization and um, you know, speaking with our law firm they're like we've only ever seen a contract of this size for an IBM. You know, we're a, we're a, you know, a handful of people um, who are starting to go through a 200 page uh, MSA before business terms are in it and you know we're we're now spending more on our on, on the legal fees on the process and even the bank oh, is saying I'm just so <laughs> happy to hear that <laughs> just I, the legal I, side or the yeah if I had <laughs> any emotions at all I'd start to cry it's just wonderful but but no but it, and, and it's like you know the good the and that's where and we'll we'll talk about the legal coming up but like the having people 
we don't have that expertise and we look for counsel that, that can help you also navigate that same way, right? You, you, we're focused on this is what we, where the technology is, this is where the security is, these are the things that we care about. But, you know, if, if everyone else is just like, eh, it's just another thing, mm -hmm. you know, then we'll just put them through the regular process. It takes 12 months to sign off on this, but that's no big deal. We'll have a meeting every month and get the stakeholders together. And, and that's what you want to avoid. And the last point here for that I just want to say and reiterate what Jay said is, yeah, give money. <laughs> uh, the, uh, well, we see this to the banks all the time. Like, we went through one where 20 months was supposed to be a, a proof of concept. It turned into an RFP. It turned into all this more. If they would have put a little bit of money out the door on, you know, in that first month, we could have done a pilot, we would have learned the lessons, and we would have grown and gone from there. Now, it's turned out great, but what they would have paid us, which is the, the cheap and cheerful kind of path, the, the nice, the, the would have made a, a complete difference on us, on our ability, whether or not we raise, and we didn't end up raising. Um, but you can impact the full direction and decision making of a startup by giving them a little money. You know, you'd have three founders sitting in your office for six months for what you would pay for just in the sales process with one of the big players. Well, look, if I, if I take you over to Switzerland and I show you a, a chasm uh, <laughs> uh, between two mountains and I, I say to you, okay, I, Art, I want you to jump from, from one mountain to the other. It's, it's, uh, it's 25 feet. It, you, you might be a little bit worried about that. And, and you'd be even more worried if I said to you, I'm going to give you some extra energy. It'll get you 12 feet. <laughs> You know that it just. That's true. I might as well give you enough. Yeah. So so you you know when you're when you're scaling up investment, make sure it's enough. To, oh, absolutely. To, to work, otherwise to actually you, do. Yeah. You're, you're dialing up failure. Absolutely, absolutely. But um, also, Art, don't go to Switzerland with Don because yeah, yeah, like I, it does not sound like some <laughs> <laughs> good advice. Um, so the the next slide really takes a look at. Um, the flip side of it. So some advice that um, uh, we can give to startups, to fintechs, um, trying to partner with major organizations. So the, the two biggest things that always come to mind for me is the change management aspect of it, where um, I'm sure there are a lot of fintechs listening uh, today where they don't really think about the change management aspect of it. They think that the, um, the, the major organization that they're partnering with will have it all covered. All we need to do is just give them the technology and it'll all work out in the end. <laughs> and in reality, that's not how it works. Um, the, the, when you think about change management, it's an exercise of what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? And you should never leave it up to your partner to figure all of that out because what will happen is frustration. Frustration that why did we partner with this small organization, this small startup who has no clue what they're doing, they have no clue what um, our, our business processes are, and now we're just in this area where there's a lot of friction and there's a lot of ambiguity. Um, so what I could recommend for all the fintechs that are out there is um, understand change management. You don't have to be um, uh, this change management professional, but if you have small dollars and you have a, and you want to hire a change management person, do so because it'll help you in the long run. If you don't, get smarter because um, your technology integration is hinging on how well that integration happens, and how well it happens hinges on you better understanding uh, the change management process. When you think about um, uh, partnerships with, with big tech that's out there, like the Apples and the, the Googles of the world, when, when I launched um, Apple Pay, Apple came to the table with tons of change management <laughs> experience and, and very, very strict rigor around this is how this needs to be done, this is how that needs to be done. I'm not saying that that's what fintechs need to do because I think there's a, there should be a nice balance in between. But, but in, fair, in fairness, though, Jay, I mean, they all they did was assume the risk that would be theirs. Yeah. I mean, they did instead of transferring risk to you, mm -hmm. they they kept what they should have kept mm -hmm. by 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 doing the change management piece mm -hmm. correctly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's really what what a not a Nirvana situation looks like because I think maybe sometimes the big uh, big techs swing the pendulum a little bit uh, uh, too far the other way where they're very prescriptive. Um, but 
um, the, the fintech players out there really do need to understand how their business can be integrated. And it, go, it goes back to the point where we do actually like it when fintech works with other FIs um, uh, globally because they start to really understand the business um, and the, the technologies that are within the rails of uh, the financial institutions. Um, the other major tip that I can provide is be honest with your business objectives. Um, be very transparent and reach out to your partner and say, I want to work with you to help you understand your business metrics, um, especially if, it, if it's the first of its kind type of implementation where there is no um, uh, case studies uh, that you can draw back upon. Um, the, and the reason that I, I emphasize this point is that um, six months down the road, a year down the road, your business targets are not being met. Um, you're not meeting any of your goals. And then people start to question the validity of why we're partnering with these fintechs. Why aren't we building internally? Don't be that one fintech that ruins it for everyone. Be very open, be very honest, um, and work actively. Um, I'm sure all of the, the major organizations that are out there would love to sit down for an hour or two in a working session trying to figure out what are those business drivers that we haven't thought about. And, you know, kind of going, I actually really agree with the change management side. I, I put the idea of focusing on security and I'd say focusing on change management as well. We're a cloud um, vendor, you know, we have uh, services in the cloud, so security uh, InfoSec was a huge critical thing for us. But any, it's, it's all those processes. So as much as I, I like to say for the organizations, they need to, to find a way to work with the startups. It doesn't absolve the startups from being, you know, being serious, being professional, uh, investing in the process change management in security because it's it's ultimately what's going to make or break your your deal. You know, we we there was another thing kind of like what you said about your 200 conversations a day. We we talked to one FI who had you know in the last 12 or 14 months they had engaged with over 100 uh, startups. I think we were the last one standing, not because you know we were the only ones with great technology, but we had you know we're a little older. We come from some security officer positions. We knew how to, you know, we, we built it from the ground up with some of those things in mind. We still had gaps, we were small, you know, we, we didn't have all the pieces in place, but we could keep progressing because they saw that we were investing in those things that, that they care about beyond just the new solution. They need to know that it's gonna integrate, that we're gonna have a process if something goes wrong. What if, as you say? Um, and, and in a, a weird way, startups are funny. Any company that's a startup is this way. You start off with like, everyone should change and adhere to our way. And then as soon as you get a little traction, you're like, no, I like this process. It stops new startups from, uh, <laughs> from, from getting in here, you know? And, and it's true. If you, if you, you know, what we've learned in the last several years of working with the banks is now is part of our defense. You know, we we're going to talk about the, the IP and, and, and going after things like that. But one of it is also just if, you're, if a couple of guys start up something similar to what we're doing, they have to go through those same lessons learned of, of how, do, how do you actually help and how do you work within those confines. A um, couple other tips just just uh, that we've been through. Number one is, um, you know, you you want to help others help you. You're selling. It's not your your product isn't going to go viral. Often, if you're partnering with a, a big organization, there's no one there searching for your solution. You know, you can put all the Google ads, you can put all the traditional stuff you would do if you're selling to the consumer out there, but there's no one in a small business line that's Googling, here's, you know, what is some new technology I didn't even know existed um, out there. So you have to find ways of communicating within the organization. And we, we've tried things like, um, you know, every time we, we do a presentation, it's usually customized to the group, and we, we come back to the office and make a video of it and share it back with them mm -hmm. so they can keep telling our story to the other stakeholders because it's, it's those introductions, it's getting people familiar with this is an idea that we could use for something we're building or something we're, we've been uh, lacking on. And so you, you need to be find ways to communicate internally because as much as that champion um, that is out there looking out for you, it's still, it's still your business and you still need to find a way to reach the people. And, and the last thing, uh, always for tips for startups, we, we tell this to, we told it to the second cohort of, uh, of some of the companies that were going through the FinTech Accelerator. Um, you know, like anything else, it's okay to say no. It's not about being um, difficult, but you know, as a startup, you're going to be asked to do more, uh, and that's okay. But there's sometimes where it's okay to say no to VCs if you're not at the right stage to raise money. It's okay to say no, or it's okay to say we're doing it this way because if you can justify that, if you bend too much, you can also break your own business. So you have to find a balance between 
what it is that you do really well and what the real businesses are and, and be comfortable that, you know, knowing that the big players also say no. They, they say, we can't do that for free for eight months. Um, you know, we need something to sustain ourselves. Uh, it's also okay to ask for more. Um, you know, whatever number is you're going to ask for your hourly rate or for your services, there's still someone probably at the bank that's going, oh my gosh, this is so, this is so cheap. Uh, you know, because you, you're probably underestimating and, and after you get through 10 or 12 different customers, you'll, you'll, you'll right size that and that's the benefit that the early adopters have as well. Um, and just know that they want your expertise. It's, you know, it's funny to, to see some of the companies that, that start up and realizing that when they're in the room, they're not just there for their technology. Um, people want to understand, they, they know you're looking closer at the market, they know you're tapped into something they're not. And they don't just want your technology, they want your expertise. Like, help us make this better. What aren't we seeing? What, what could we be doing more? And, and be confident and be ca capable of articulating that because that's, it's what's going to give you that credibility to know that even if they're a little off point on this one thing, their knowledge tells us we want to work with them. Let's help them get there because they, they have insight into things. And it's just those are things that we've learned, you know, kind of from our, our journey today. And, and if I could just touch upon your second point around the presentation mm -hmm. um, that, the, that the fintechs develop uh, for major organizations. The way that I think about it is that if you're not coming in with a hybrid presentation that looks like a Harvard application slash MTV presentation, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. <laughs> there are so many fintechs that are out there globally today that are vying for yeah. space and vying for these, these rich conversations with financial institutions. Put your best foot forward. Put the diligence behind creating an amazing presentation that yeah. shows use cases, that shows a demo. Um, I've had uh, fintechs um, uh, approach me and I've had introductory conversations with them where it, it was just maybe one or two slides mm -hmm. and they were fumbling through their presentation. And while their capability might have been great, um, their experience um, and the m my assessment of our future ability to work with them um, was just crossed off. There, there was no way that we would ever yeah. work with a uh, not mature organization. So yeah. really, really echoing Art's point that put your best foot forward. Harvard slash MTV presentation <laughs> is like always that. the like best. <laughs> yes. So by the close of uh, 2017, there were over 113,000 patent publications related to fintech, which is you know a staggering amount of uh, you know patent publications, and they covered all aspects of uh, the financial industry, such as uh, you know payment services, banking, wealth management, insurance, and lending, and they all had a technology angle, and that included uh, you know data and analytics, you know big data, really big data. Cloud computing, IoT, mobile platform security, and uh, cryptocurrency. So patenting in this space is not really, you know, something new. I mean, this has been going on for a while, but it really ramped up at the end of, uh, you know, just after the crash of 2008. And that's where you saw, you know, big banks such as, you know, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Goldman, Goldman Sachs, uh, as being, you know, the leaders in uh, patenting the inventions. So things were moving on quite well until 2014. Uh, you know, that was uh, the 19th of June of 2014 <laughs> to be exact. And this is the day that the Supreme Court handed down a decision related to a method of reducing risk. It was a computer implemented method for reducing risk in a trading scheme similar to uh, escrow. And they essentially say that, you know, this wasn't patentable and this started uh, the patent office started rejecting any computer implemented inventions mm -hmm. and the court started invalidating patents and it just became a little bit harder to get you know, these inventions through the uh, patent office. And it placed a lot of scrutiny on anything that had software related claims. So you have to remember that before this we had um, allowance rates at about 172 allowances a month and that dropped to about you know, 25 you know, allowances per month. That, but that still shows you can you can get a patent through. Oh, absolutely, and absolutely. It just means that we have to do things differently now. No. We have to draft our patent claims in light of this decision. You know, so we have to really describe you know what you're actually doing with your uh, you know with your software. We have to describe that you know this is something that a human mind cannot do by itself. You have to use a computer, and that the computer is actually doing something significantly more. 
than you know what a computer really does. You know, you have to uh, stress that you know we're going beyond what a computer does. A general purpose computer. Exactly, not a general purpose computer. So in the context of fintech, you know, it could be software that's related to uh, speeding up trading or reducing latency in trading, such as, you know, high frequency trading or unique payment method, uh, you know, such as cryptocurrency. So I'm going to talk a little bit about blockchain patents uh, because, you know, this is really, um, you know, where the next gold rush is. And if you look at blockchain patents, you see that these patents are related to all aspects of blockchain technology. Uh, you know, we have patents that are related to the platform itself, you know, the platform for, you know, uh, smart contracts or, um, or our enterprise. And we also have uh, patents that are related to consensus methods, ledger types, authentication, algorithms, and even the mining aspect of uh, Bitcoin. You know, we have patents that are related to that, you know, so there's a whole range of uh, patents that are related to blockchain patent. Next slide. So just to give you a flavor of blockchain patents, uh, there's one that was recently granted to uh, Bank of America, and this is related to a cryptocurrency transformation system. What this is really is just a patent for a platform for exchanging, for, for managing exchange rates between fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies, and managing the transfer requests and the customer accounts. So this application was initially rejected by the patent office. But after looking at the office action, the patent agents were able to amend the claims to make sure that, you know, they explain in detail, you know, how this operation actually worked. So they had to go into details about the actual public uh, keys and the private keys and how they're exchanging the keys between the different float accounts. So they had an Alice problem to begin with. Absolutely, yeah. It was an Alice problem and also a one-on-one -on -one rejection. So they had to deal with that. So it goes back to the idea of really explaining, you know, what what is behind the actual solution. Another one is from FICO, and this is about preventing uh, money laundering. And it's just a, programming, a programmable system that gathers public available data from crypto, crypto, exchange, crypto, 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 sorry, cryptocurrency exchanges and miners to track the flow of digital certificates. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then they generate threat scores and identify if there is any kind of money laundering going on. And another one is from uh, MasterCard, and this one you will especially love if you're mm -hmm. any um, startup that sells anything. You know, typically what happens when you buy, when someone buys something, it takes a few days for you to actually, you know, settle that, you know, for, for the settlement to occur. But in this case, you know, it's going to be instantaneous, you know, based on uh, what they disclose in this, uh, in this application. And hopefully the transaction fees will be less too. Hmm. Now, Big banks, you know, uh, FIs have no issues with, uh, w with patents. You know, they have big resources, they have internal teams that are dedicated to, you know, making sure that they protect the inventions. So the question is, you know, are startups actually patenting their own inventions? And it turns out that 33% of all funded startups actually have patents, and 19% of them actually file an application before they even receive any funding. And if you were to ask, um, you know, these fintech startups, you know, what, why did you choose to protect your inventions? You know, they'll probably tell you a whole bunch of things. So they'll probably say that having patents boosted um, the valuation of the company, and it also helped them to uh, get funded. They may also say that, you know, having patents helped to deter patent infringement and also patent suits. They may also tell you that having patents increase the leverage, you know, during negotiations, uh, you know, through uh, uh, negotiations when you're negotiating partnership agreements or co-development co agreements. And also, help, having patents also helps you the chance of, uh, you know, exiting, you know, because that is a, that's a, truly an asset that you have when you have patents. I mean, if you look at an example of uh, WePay, which was acquired by J.P. Morgan for $400 million, they had a few patents in the, in the patent portfolio, and I think that actually helped. You have to be willing to sue, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you have you to enforce. In fairness, <laughs> yeah. You, you have to be, but, you yeah. know, litigation is really the last resort. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's better to, uh, you know, to have patents and uh, 
and, and go from well, there. Re remember what I do for a living. I understand <laughs> that. I understand that. I understand that. Once again, you have to be willing to sue. <laughs> So if you're a fintech and uh, you're thinking of pat patenting your, uh, your inventions, uh, your innovations, uh, there are certain things that you should be aware of. And when it comes to patent law, you really have to keep track of your dates. You know, so these are critical dates such as you know, the date of uh, disclosure, the date that you first disclosed your invention to the public, and the date that you actually invented the, uh, uh, your, your invention. Uh, because in certain jurisdictions, you know, if you don't file for a patent application before, sorry, so in certain jurisdictions, before you file an application, you should make sure that you haven't disclosed it to anyone. Otherwise, you lose your patent rights. And you should also make sure that you file early because it's really the first person who files, the first company that files that gets the patent. And file first before you start pitching, uh, you know, before you start. Uh, talking to investors, looking for, for money and that kind of stuff. And make sure that you own it. Make sure that everyone in your company actually has signed an IP assignment agreement, making sure that the IP belongs to the company. And if in doubt, please ask for help. You know, we're here to help. You know, this is something that we do. And given the potential value of IP in the fintech space, you should make sure that it's done correctly. So just... Uh Sorry, if I could just jump in for a quick moment Absolutely. Um, and say around the, the patents, um, we did get a question around where can I find trends that are happening within the fintech space. Um, what I always like to do is obviously there's Google and there's going to those consulting firms and getting their, their white papers. Everyone can do that. But what I actually like to do is going on the, um, the patent websites um, that the Absolutely. governments have yep. available and you can see all of the things that are going to be happening two years from now, three years from now, there are still ideas. Absolutely. Um, and uh, when you start to filter through, I've noticed that a lot of them are um, ac academia. Um, they're professors and they're doctors um, uh, developing patents in the fintech space um, around certain customer experiences. And I think what, what we all should be doing as major financial institutions is if we want to be ahead of the curve, that's really the source uh, to start looking at. Uh, absolutely. Every Tuesday, the U.S. Patent Office patent applications are published. You know, so if you get into the habit of just going on the U.S. Patent Office website and just looking at what's been published, you see that you know there's a lot going on in this space, and it really helps to understand what other people are doing. You know, so yeah, for for sure, you know, uh, that's uh, that's a good way to uh, stay on track of what's going on. Well, uh, you know, every patent. It isn't worth anything unless it solves a problem mm -hmm. or creates an opportunity. And and uh, uh, you know if you if you're not on top of what the problems are or the opportunities, you really you're not in business. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly a very good way to do it. So just by way of of, uh, <coughs> of sort of summing up, uh, uh, just what we've what we've been talking about is that fintechs are really good at inventing technology. Uh, they, they may or may not be good at, uh, at uh, uh, sort of um, re maintaining relationships with banks. Banks are happy to have relationships, but there are, there are a lot of people out there to have relationships with. Uh, please remember that it's risky for a bank to, to do business with a, with a little guy, and, and uh, so do whatever you can to uh, minimize that, uh, that risk, and by all means, work with the banks who show up at the incubators and Marses of this world uh, to uh, uh, and, and talk to them and make sure they, they know who you are and make sure you understand them. Uh, people like, uh, like Jay are always happy to, uh, to, to talk to you. Um, also make sure you've got uh, legal counsel uh, that, uh, that understands uh, uh, banks uh, not not all counsel do, uh, and uh, but if you have uh, a counsel that uh, that understands what banks need and how to talk to banks, you'll have a bit better chance of uh, of uh, concluding some kind of an arrangement. Um, now we we got a a, a bunch of uh, of good questions from the uh, from the uh, uh, the listeners, and the problem is we're we're really <laughs> out of time. So I undertake to. Uh, to send an email to everybody who has sent in a, uh, a note and uh, uh, see if we can provide some answers over the next day or so.
That's great. Thanks, Don, and uh, thanks to everyone. So as Don said, unfortunately, we are out of time. So we would like to thank uh, everyone for participating in our webinar this morning. Thank you to the, uh, the participants and the listeners. Please note that the audio recording and a copy of today's presentation will be circulated later this week in a follow-up piece. Additionally, if you are interested in learning more about Bitcoin and blockchain technology, we will be hosting a webinar on this topic on Wednesday, February 14th. Oh, Wednesday. Stay tuned for more information on this session. And thank you again for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.